I'm Jane Little Botkin. Um, I'm a Texan born and bred, don't hold that against me. I know I'm in Colorado, but three days ago I moved to New Mexico. Uh, just literally unloaded three days ago. And my husband and I drove up here, it took two days to get up here. We're just, we're absolutely thrilled to be here and visit. My husband used to ski here almost 50 years ago. So anyway, uh, I want to give you a little bit about my creds, so to speak. Uh, I am an author. I was an English teacher, senior English teacher for 30 years, for 30 years. And uh, once I retired, I started writing. I was 58 years old. I didn't know I could do that. Always wanted to, but it turned out that I had um, an infamous relative, or so the family thought, in my family. And he was actually in my son's advanced placement history books. And my son would say, well, who is this? It, why am I writing about him? And I said, well, that's our uncle. And he was considered a traitor. My uncle was Frank Little, who was a member of the Industrial Workers of the World. He was what was called a wobbly. He was hanged in 1917, dragged out of his boarding house in Butte, Montana dragged behind a car on granite paved streets, his kneecaps almost torn off. And he was hanged at about three o'clock in the morning and he had a sign on him that said, uh, 3377, uh, the measurements of a grave. Okay, they thought it was actually the vigilante code that belonged to the Masons. We know that now. Um, and he was killed for his free speech. He was organizing in Butte, he was organizing hard rock miners. The greatest mining catastrophe that had ever happened had happened in Butte, Montana that summer, in fact, just a week, a couple weeks before he got there. It's still, it's still the greatest amount of deaths, number of deaths that have ever happened when there was an accident. And the accident was basically caused because of the mining companies not practicing good, safe conditions. Um, and all of these men asphyxiated, some burned, some were charred. Uh, it was horrible about 268 miners. I'm trying to get my numbers right. So I decided, oh, and as a result of Frank's death, this country shut down. Uh, all of the industries shut down that they were getting ready, that they needed for the World War I. We were just ramping up to get into the war, and uh, they needed the coal, they needed the, the copper miners, they needed the uh, loggers, they needed the farmers that were working in the wheat fields, they needed the munitions industry. And what all these workers did is they shut down, they stopped working. We had a national, we had national strikes. And probably, let's see, Frank was murdered on August 1st, 1917. And on September 5th, 1917, there was a national raid into every IWW hall in the United States. They arrested all of these Wallies. They said they were traitors. They said that IWW did not stand for Industrial Workers of the World, but it stood for Imperial, Imperial, Imperial Wilhelm's Warriors, meaning that they were agents of the German Army. And they weren't. They weren't at all. This was the propaganda machine that the newspapers were doing. The newspapers, of course, at this time, were owned by these very corporations that were the robber barons that were running all of the industries in the country. And World War I was a way to make great money. And so you've heard the expression, it was a rich man's war, poor man's fight. Well, this is where that came from. And the Wobblies were very, very good at keeping lists. They mimeographed everything. So when they went into those offices and they did those raids, they went into the trash cans, they pulled those mimeograph copies, they went into all their files, and they had more names, and more people were arrested. Now, I'm telling you this because this is the framework for the story I'm getting ready to get into. In February 1918, and you can thank Montana for this, the first Sedition Act had been passed. This Sedition Act, which became the cookie cutter for the entire United States, said that if you said anything against the United States, if you said anything against the uniform, if you said anything against the war effort, if you even spoke in a foreign language while you were standing in line to register for the draft, you were arrested. If you had any papers that, that were to those ideas, that was treason and you were arrested. This was passed, everybody. We've done, this is what we've done in our country before, so just keep that in mind. And so a bunch of people did go to prison. And of course, my uncle was killed because he gave a few speeches in Butte, Montana. 
and he was encouraging these miners to organize. And the Anaconda Mining Company did not like that. And uh, by the way, there's a great podcast called uh, Death in the West. It's 10 episodes. It is about this murder and who did it. It is still a mystery in View, Montana. It's a fascinating pod podcast to listen to. It. And if you can, you ought to do that. Well, it took eight years for me to research that book because Frank had gone into like 10 different states to organize, including right here in Colorado. His brother, my other uncle, was a hard rock miner in uh, First Alice uh, in the Central City Black Hawk dis Mining District. And then he went on to Cripple Creek and he was a hard rock miner there. And then he joined my uncle in Arizona where they were hard rock miners there and then in, Arizona, and in, then in California. Uh, as Frank rose up in the ranks, he became uh, chairman of the executive board for the IWW, and that got him into other states where they were organizing up to 1917. But what started the IWW had to do with Colorado. In 1903 and 1904, we had our first coal labor wars, our, our labor wars. And these were uh, mainly they were down in the southern Front Range area, uh, around Tulliaride, Cripple Creek, that area. And again, these were not IWWs. These were uh, Western Federation of Miners. They got a horrible nickname. They started calling them, again, the propaganda was, the propaganda machine was huge. Uh, the mine owner companies, uh, the Mine Owners Association, which is what these guys joined, uh, along with store owners and other businessmen in these towns, they called them the Western Federation of Murderers. <laughs> and they weren't. But again, it's that propaganda. And there was a cold, there was a strike. And the strike began uh, because they were trying to help actually a mill in Colorado City. And everybody jumped in on helping on that and it just spread. One of the things I want, I'm going to show today, I know this is supposed to be like rowdy and, and the unseemly part. Oh, I'm going to get to that. Believe me, it's got to be in there because I want you to have that while you're drinking your beer. But you've got to understand this context is that the Colorado National Guard was just not a very nice organization. And I'm sure they are today, but they weren't then. And the Colorado National Guard was called in to put down these strikes and the methods that they used were horrible. And in many cases, well, not many, several, uh, the very owners of mine, com mine owners' companies or the superintendents were actually officers in the Colorado National Guard. And so you have this conflict of interest. Uh, one particular man I'm going to be talking about is Bulkley Wells, who was uh, infamous in Telluride. And he was actually the son-in-law of the man that owned the mining company. He was the superintendent of the mine. He became the sheriff of the county, and he also was uh, an officer in the Colorado National Guard. And so, and that's gonna tie into this story. So I'll be talking about that. And one of the things I, wanna point, I wanted to point out is, well, let me finish this, I'll go back. I get excited and I kind of jump ahead, you know? I can't help it, I, I love these topics. In 1903 and 1904, because of these strikes and because of the Colorado National Guard, uh, they, it actually, there was a case with Bulkley Wells and General Sherman Bell that eventually went to the Supreme Court. And that was over the fact that they were arresting miners. They had arrested the leaders of, at the time, the Western Miners, uh, Western Miners Federation, Federation of Western Miners, who had been Big Bill Haywood, who later became the Secretary Treasurer of the IWW. Threw them in jail without access to attorneys, you know, there's no habeas corpus. I mean, put this threw them in jail. And they said that it was military necessity. And I'll be talking about that in a moment. In other words, you have no civil rights if it's military necessity. This was a big deal. And it actually went to the Supreme Court. Oliver Wendell Holmes was presiding. And you know what? These guys won with that. They won. So another example of that is if you know the Bisbee deportation where they took all of the miners plus all these other people. It's also the summer of July 1917. They rounded up 1,200 miners 
in Bisbee, Arizona, they put them on a freight train in 110 degrees, cattle cars with manure up to their knees, took them out into the desert and dumped them. And that also went to court, uh, and it was, again, it was necessity, military's necessity to keep the peace or whatever it was that the mine companies really wanted done so that they could make money because of the war. All right, so that is the background, that's the context. So the industrial workers of the world formed in 1905 because of what happened to the Western Federation of Miners. And when they formed, they became a socialist union and they were mainly socialists. Many of them were part of the Socialist Labor Party. My uncle actually quit them because he said they were too political. Mm -hmm. And he was more like a libertarian socialist. There is something like that, but he was. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't believe that government should call the shots on anything. And they said that instead of like the United Mine Workers Association or the Western Federation of Miners, the IWW was open to all trades, so this was very attractive. And if you did not have a trade, you could join. And if you were a woman, you could join. And the way it had been was the Western Federation of Miners would not work with any blacks. Mexicans were not allowed to go into the mines, they had to stay on the top. So there was a lot of extreme prejudice there too. So the IWW was very attractive, especially to the immigrants who had come here to mine. Okay, so this organization grows. While I was researching Frank Little, I came across a gal named Jane Street. And I just, it was just one of these little notations. I was going on every different rabbit hole I could that he had helped this girl organize housemaids in Denver. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. So here's my other creds. My, that was my father's family, well, it's my father's dad's family my father's mother's family. My great-grandmother was a Scandinavian, a Danish first-generation immigrant from Iowa. We think she probably was a lady of the evening. <laughs> she had one child when she was in her early 30s. And the story, I mean, my grandmother never knew who her father was. My grandmother was born in Denver. So see, I may be a Texan, but my grandmother was born in Denver. <laughs> there we go. And my grandmother died early. She, married, she ended up marrying a, a, a divorcee who was a mining superintendent in Louisville, Colorado. He was superintendent over the coal mines when these strikes were going on. Here we go. And so he ended up kill, uh, killing himself accidentally on Dead Man's Hill near Fort Collins. And my grandmother was whisked away to Iowa with all of her kinfolk and married off to a man who was 30-something years old and she was 15. She ran away. She went to Boulder. And I found her, she got a job in a mansion in Boulder as a domestic. So I'm like, whoa, this is kind of cool. Same time that Jane Street was organizing. So there you go. I had to research it. All right, so this is the mantra. She came to Denver to make a difference. Bold women change history. This is from, uh, from Denver. This is from the Colorado, Colorado Women's History Center. Um, and I put on there, naughty. Well. Yeah, it's a little colorful. Nope, oh, let me see here. There we go. All right, on the left is Jane Street. Isn't she pretty? And on the right is her nasty sister, Grace. You see the difference in the way they're dressed. Both girls were born in Indiana. Uh, there, there had been a lot of deaths in the family. Their mother had a lot of problems with depression. And so they moved to Arkansas to Hearts Hot Springs because of the hot springs. Grace was a nude model. She was a burlesque dancer. Nobody in the family knew what she was doing. Uh, and Jane was the upstanding young lady who went to, got classes to become a stenographer. So they're kind of like the yin yang. But they were very, very close. And when Jane's father died, a young man started courting her. I say young man, I say that loosely. His name was Jack Street, and this is where her last name comes in. Her real name was Tuttle, Jane Tuttle. He kind of stepped in because the father was gone, but he was in his 30s, and Jane was 17. This immediately reminded me of my grandmother. And he started grooming her like a pedophile does. And so I have up there all these descriptors of him because he is going to show up again in the Colorado National Guard. 
in Denver. And I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up. So anyway, I didn't know this. And it's funny because the, the uh, Street family, they actually asked me to research some of this, the Devlin family, and they were like, oh, they didn't know. And so, you know, we're, if there's, you know, his name was Herbert Bumpus. It wasn't really Jack Street, you know. But his real name was Herbert Bumpus. Jane did not know that. He was using an alias for good reason. He had been brought back in chains aboard a steamer in 1898, Spanish-American War. Of course, he told everyone what a wonderful soldier he had been. He had great stories. And his name really was Herbert Bumpus. Well, as he started excelling at debauchery and con, you know, con man, he actually was an arsonist, burned down a building to get an insurance check with his brother. He started going by Jack Street. And Jane met him as Jack Street. Okay? So he starts working on Jane because there's no father in the family. Mother is not paying attention. Grace is not there. She's doing her thing up on Coney Island. And Jane gets pregnant. He doesn't marry her. And she loses the baby. Now, you've got to think, this has got to be about, uh, Jane was born in 1878. So this was about 1908. And that's pretty, you know, that's pretty bad to be an unwed potential mother at this time from a respectable family. Uh, so what does Jane do? She gets pregnant again. Now, I don't want you to think that her judgment is very poor, but it was in men with both of these young ladies. And he says, okay, I'll marry you. But he whisks her off completely out of town, away, away from Hot, Hot Springs. And he keeps another job as Herbert Bumpus. He gets a job as Jack, as Jack Street. And he has another wife who's pregnant also in Hot Springs that she doesn't even know about. This propels her. She did marry him. She leaves him. Grace comes home and they take off for California because there's vaudeville. But, so this is how you know people do this. It's really unusual for women to travel by themselves like this at this time period, but they did. So they take off and they leave their mother and they head to Sacramento, California. And Jane gets a job as a stenographer in a hotel. She has her own stand. And she works. She's very professional. And Grace has been, she's really very talented, and she's being trained as an a opera singer for a, an ex, the Pacific ex, Exhibition that was getting ready to happen. While they're in Sacramento, the IWW has started speaking. They are speaking on street corners, and all these people have flooded into California to get jobs, and there are not enough jobs. And Jane's really paying attention to this. The hotel workers are organizing, and Jane is working in a hotel. And one day, she joins. I mean, she's not, she has so few influences, except for what happened with Jack Street and her sister, and what she's hearing on these street corners in these hotels. She joins, as probably uh, a hotel work is what she's going to do, because she's working in a hotel. Now, she has taken her son with her. She loves motherhood more than anything. She will, would kill for her children. And at this point, she has one child. She's going to have three by the time we get finished with this. All right, so we are now at 1914. She has been working in California. And these happy faces here become this. And this is what ends the 1913-1914 coal wars in Colorado. And in Route County in, in 1913, this was also going on. The, coal, the miners were striking. There were 400 miners striking in Oak Creek. By the way, the same men, the same businessmen that organized Cripple Creek organized Oak Creek. You have all those years apart, but it's the same guys that organize. So you see how this is all connecting. Jane, this hits the newspapers big time because this is, uh, this is Rockefeller, J.D. Rockefeller Jr.'s worst thing that he ever did. And as much as he tried to deny it, play it down, it was his train. And of course, who were the soldiers? They were the Colorado National Guard. And granted, Troop A in particular, I'm going to pick on Troop A. Troop A, many of those men had gone back to their homes because this was, you know, 
lots of times volunteer, obviously, with the Colorado National Guard. And some of these thugs that belonged to, like, the Teals or the Pinkerton or the Burns agencies had taken place, they were thugs. And, of course, when this gun was brought in, this Gatling gun-type machine, it wasn't a machine gun, but that type of gun, it actually wasn't a Gatling gun, it was something else, but it's like a Gatling gun. It was brought in. These were the National Guard. He's in, he's in a uniform. They, the Maya, these people, of course, were mostly immigrant. They, do, does everybody know Ludlow? What happened in Ludlow? You should. It's a watershed moment in labor history, nationally. And so when this happened, and you had, what, two mothers and 11 children who perished, it made national news. And we had wire services then. It was going over all across the country, and Rockefeller could not hide from this at all. That ended the Colorado labor wars of 1914, 13 and 14. All right, Jane Street is there in Sacramento. She's reading these papers, and this is the talk. And the most famous IWW woman, young woman, was Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. And she is traveling the country and she's speaking about Ludlow. And Jane is soaking in every word. She loves children. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn said, the mistress in the parlor has nothing to do with the maid in the kitchen. Now, you, I know that Denver is not really your favorite place to talk about, but you have to understand that a lot of the most important people in all of Colorado ended up on Capitol Hill in Denver. Even the uh, governor of Wyoming during the Johnson County cattle, uh, cattle War, or you know when that was horrible, brought in all those Texans, you know, to kill the people in Wyoming, he fled to Capitol Hill in Denver. So you had all these people that had moved to Denver, the, the very elite, and many of them had husbands who had volunteered for the Colorado National Guard. And when these women and children were killed, they were publicly saying things like, well, the miners probably killed the women and children themselves because they were a drain to the union. Or they are nothing but cattle, they ought to have been shot. Or the Battle of Ludlow was the most magnificent ever put up by citizen soldiery. So Jane Street, and her sister Grace, whose job had flubbed, decided to go to Colorado to teach these women a lesson. And that's where the story is. What she did was she got to Colorado, she went to Denver, and she'd never been a maid. She was a stenographer. But she ran an ad in local newspapers that said, wanted, let's just say, chambermaid. Uh, this is what the pay was. Send, call me or send me a letter. That particular person would come to her thinking that she was like an uh, 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 employment agent, okay? We called them sharks at the time because they took advantage of them. And she said, no, no, I really don't have a job, but I found one for you. I want you to go to this place and see if it works out. And if it doesn't come back. In doing so, she started meeting all the domestics in Denver. And she would send them to these other jobs, and if they didn't work out, back, out, they'd come back. And then she started having what was called experience meetings. So she'd say, okay, we're going to have a meeting next Tuesday night. Come. And they would stand up, and they would tell their experiences working in these mansions. You know, we're fed the table scraps. We have to live in the basement. We live in the attic. It's dra 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 uh, there's drafty. Um, no social time at all. Social, uh, Sundays, you have to cook Sunday dinner. You don't have time off. When you do have time off, you have to stay in your room. You can't have any friends. You might sew or read. Uh, I mean, horrible pay, thrown out of a house. One lady was thrown out of a house because the woman decided she didn't want to pay her, and she accused her of stealing a gown, and the woman had not stolen a gown. But that way, the, the mistress didn't have to pay her. I have a chapter in my book that starts out with a mistress being served a cold storage egg versus a fresh egg, and the girl was fired. These stories, these things were really happening. And so they're telling these stories. And Jane gets up in front of them and she goes, you know what? You can organize. And they're going, what? It's like, it's illegal to even talk about this. How can we do that? And they don't even know each other. 
I mean, they're, they're kept in these houses and they're getting to meet all these people. And Jane literally organizes the first domestics union, IW union, and it was in Denver. Now it's time to punish the mistresses. And she does this over a period of several months. She ends up with 300 women. Can you imagine? 300. And the newspapers start having fun playing with this. This is this came out uh, in the this was in Denver, but it actually went national. This was picked up by the AP and went national. The women, the maids, were not doing this. They weren't putting too much pepper in food. They weren't starching shirts too much. They weren't throwing the dishes. They weren't doing that sort of thing. But they, the mistresses wanted people to know that they were um, they didn't like this. Be oh, I mean, I left off the most important part. Jane had the girls write on a card who they worked for, how big the house was, how many children there were, what their duties were, and how they were treated. So when one of the women came back and said, I need another job, and this one, this lady, Mrs. Brown on such and such street has one, they go to that file, oh no, the bad reputation here. Mrs. Brown couldn't get anybody to work for her. So they had this blacklist, this file, which became very important, had 3,000 names in it. I mean, they were controlling Denver. And so Jane was literally punishing these women who were so snooty about the miners' wives and the children. And on top of that, the employment agencies were losing money because they were working with the madams, also these houses. So instead of the maids going to an employment agency and paying a dollar to get placed in a job, they were going to Jane. They didn't have to pay a dang thing. And on top of that, Jane now has a clubhouse for them. Come, we'll sing, we'll eat together, we'll sing songs, we'll share our experiences, we'll get more people to join. It all worked beautifully. Now, this is a nasty woman. This is <laughs> Louise Sneed Hill. She was married to Nathaniel Hill, whose father was Nathaniel Hill Sen Sr., who had owned much of Central City Blackhawk. Lots and lots of mine money. He was a silver spoon in his mouth. The son married this socialite from the South, Louise Sneed. She ended up controlling all of Denver society. She is known for forming what was called the Sacred 36. And the Sacred 36 was at her house, her mansion, which was almost 7,000 square feet. Down, by the way, a lot of these houses were that large and these maids were having to clean. Which was down from the governor's mansion. She had a drawing room that was 72, 72 feet long, and she could set up nine card tables to play bridge. And so if you were on that list of the 36 who could be invited to her card games, you were somebody. It was a social register. She is nasty. She is married to Nathaniel Hill, but she's having an affair with Bulkley Wells who is our adjutant general, who was the one who rode down people with his horses in Telluride, Colorado during the Colorado Labor War in 1903 and 1904. She even has two paintings hanging in her house, one of her husband, Nathaniel, which is real small, and one of Bulkley Wells in tight polo pants uh, next to it. There was, they would literally go around, the three of them, there was a rumor that there was a menage a trois going on, they would ride around together a lot of talk about the sexual activities of these three. But it was well known that she was having an affair with Buckley Wells because Nathaniel Hill was like milk toast. So the, these other ladies on Capitol Hill did not like her. She was not invited to join the housewives union or whatever assembly that formed to fight Jane. So Louise decided to help Jane. And that's how that played out. And the thing is, Jane didn't want her help at all, but she inserts herself about how perfect her house domestics are, however happy they are. And they were. They worked for her for like 20 and 30 years. I mean, she really had something going well. But the irony that she's with Bulkley Wells, you know, this, there's a, there's a bad story to that in the, in the end. I'll tell you that in a minute. <laughs> now, what are the things about domestics? At that time, they actually did a labor study in 1914, came out in 1915 or so, was that they, they studied all the occupations in the United States. The labor secretary at that time was named Wilson, not the president, you know, to be confused with the president. And they found that domestics had the most dangerous job of any employment there was in the United States. 
Uh, they could uh, be sexually abused in these homes by the owners. They could be thrown out on the streets. They had a very dangerous life. And in fact, uh, Maddie Silk's brothel is probably one of the more famous brothels that happened. If you worked for Maddie Silk's as a prostitute, you were well fed, you had doctor's care, you dressed in silks, you had a wonderful room. You had it better than a domestic did that was living down in the basement. Some of these girls, when they were thrown out of homes, they had no other job that they could get. And some of them did turn to prostitution, not for someone like Maddie Silks, but where they had to get their own crib, and they really didn't make any money, and of course they died. But that's kind of where the, the, they were. The irony of all of this is that these very women in Colorado who had these mansions were the movers and shakers. They were the suffragists. They were the activists. They're the ones who went after the women's vote. They were the women that were trying to help the poor orphans from whatever country there was. But they could care less about the domestics who were working in their homes so that during their leisure time, they could go do that activism. Okay? All right. So what do these elite women do? Boy, they got to get a hold of that blacklist. And they do. They hire some old gumshoes to start spying on Jane in this one building that she has her offices in. And Jane had even gotten to where she was sleeping with a gun under her pillow. She had a, a piece of pipe next to her bed. She was afraid. But the bathroom was upstairs, like two, two, stores, two doors up. And one morning she went upstairs to go to the bathroom and she hadn't locked the door. And they came in and stole the file. And so now what do they do? Of course, the newspapers play on this. They say, now that the horse is gone, the union, the union has locked its doors. Now that it's gone. Well, what do you do if you're someone like Jane Street? You start over. And that's what she did. She rebuilt the file. She also moved. And she moved into a house. And when she moved into that house, she said, no men are allowed. No men are allowed. She made another enemy, the IWW men. They're not very happy. This fellow here, his name was Colonel Sellers, and the Bureau of Investigation, they didn't call it the FBI at the time, they called it the Bureau of Investigation, they said he was probably the most dangerous of all the Wobblies there were in 1918, 1919, when they started following him. He has found, fallen in love, he thinks, with Jane Street. He's infatuated with her so much that he tries to rape her in her offices. That has also happened. And unfortunately, some, another IWW is walking by when it happens, and he tells everyone. And of course, these other men, these wobblies, are unhappy because they can't go inside the new clubhouse. And they start spreading a rumor that really what Jane Street has is a whorehouse. And it's not, but that's what they're saying, and they want that to get to Big Bill Haywood, who is now, as I said, the secretary treasurer of the IWW. So she now has the Madams of Color, Colorado Capitol Hill against her. She's got these IWW local men against her. Um, and she's got the employment agencies against her because they had been losing money. And then now they say this, Big, Big Bill Haywood. Well, there he is, the most glamorous man on Colorado's front range. That's Bulkley Wells. <laughs> I did have a photo of him with those tight pants on. I couldn't find it, but I was gonna show that to you. So, now that the women decide to organize and bring in the YWCA, they do not invite Louise Need Hill because of Bulkley Wells. But the Colorado National Guard is for front and center again when Jack Street shows up to Denver. He comes as Jack Street and immediately gets involved with a 17-year-old girl. And this girl thinks that he is just the best. Now, between Jane and this 17-year-old girl, he's had at least two other marriages besides the marriage he had in Hot Springs. And every situation ended very badly. At one point, he was called Dr. Love. He was part of the Love Society. And I mean, this man is something else. So he shows up, he seduces this young lady, she wants to marry him. They're going to send Troop A 
from Golden, Colorado, the rifle range at Golden, Colorado. They're going to send him down to fight Pancho Villa. They're going to send him down to Columbus. He's leaving. Oh, he has to marry me. So she tells her mother. Her mother says, hell no. He's bad. He's, he's not the kind of guy I want you dating. She had been in the hospital for a few months. She didn't know that her daughter was already sleeping with him. She was 17. He is mid mid 30s, almost 40, I guess. So when she finds out she can't marry him, she goes into the recruiting station in Denver. She takes a pistol out of her purse and she blows her brains out right there. And he's there. Now, until this point, no one knew what everybody believed that Jane Street was a widow. So here comes the next little linchpin. This becomes the biggest case in Colorado, and it actually was a case across the nation. I read somewhere it was the first time that somebody was tried on 100% circumstantial information. What they did is they found letters that he had written this girl, Gladys, and that Gladys had written him, and in it, it was very clear there was at least statutory rape. She, the mother, is furious in blaming him for this girl's death. They were all at the, at the station at the same time when this happened. And so it makes national news. We have a big court case. And one very industrious reporter says, oh, I just found out he is Jane Street's husband. So now Jane has this behind her. This kind of, this sullies her completely. The National Guard shows up to court and intimidates the judge. And when a defense attorney says, oh, you know, they are the National Guard, you should know that. He's a perfect example of how horrible our, the Colorado National Guard is. By the way, they were so bad, the Colorado National Guard was, that in 1916, uh, Fort Collins, um, the university at Fort Collins was called a and I think, or something, it was a and &M. They would not allow uh, the National Guard to be on campus. They said, you can have anybody else, another type of ROTC group, but you cannot have the National Guard. Their, their reputation is too bad. They gotta clean up their act. So now everybody knows that Jane was lying. She was really divorced. It was really bad to be divorced. And Jack Street walks because that attorney said these things, the National Guard comes in and they tell the judge, we are going to sue you for defamation of character because you said all this stuff publicly. Well, we will sue you. And the jury came back. They didn't get the right verdict. They sent the, the jury back. They came back again with the verdict they wanted. And Jack Street gets a promotion. That's how they rewarded him. All right, World War I starts. This is the interesting thing about Jane. The IWW, when, it, when World War I started, there was a big deal like, do we go sign up for the draft? There was a national day on June 5th, 1917. Everybody was expected to sign up for the draft. Well, they don't know what to do. Haywood does not want to put out a statement because basically he was a chicken. And he said, well, I don't know. Uh, you just put down that you're a conscientious objector if you want. There were other people who wanted to fight. You have to understand that in World War I, we had people here, the Irish were here working in the mines. The Irish, their enemies were the English, who we were allying with. You had Finnish here, who were holding a lot of occupations. Their natural enemy were the Russians. They didn't want to fight with them. So, and others, yes, I'll join. And so this became kind of a big deal with the IWW. They were not pro-war at all. They said, this is not our war. This is, this is the capitalist war. Jane was born in Indiana. She was a red blood American. And by golly, if, you know, they're gonna have a shortage in Colorado of workers because the men are going off, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll help you. I'll substitute you, the cops, the nurses, the whatever you need, I will substitute my maids we will come help you. Well, Big Bill Haywood didn't like that either. So she gets in trouble completely. So this is one thing Haywood said, no, no better way to restore the feeling of manhood to the hearts of the workers than sabotage. And sabotage it is. 
They break into Jane's newest little clubhouse in Denver, and they steal, they break in, they muscle past the women where no men are allowed, they tear up her charter, throw it in pieces on the floor, and she's done. It was a good run. It started uh, in 1916. It ended in 1917, but not because of this, but because Frank Little had been murdered, and she had just met him in Bisbee to try to get her charter back right before he was killed. And they had the Bisbee deportation, and everybody in Colorado that was a member of the IWW fled, and they went to Arizona, because Arizona was where the war effort was going to be because of the copper mines. They were going to shut down those copper mines and shut down the war. And Jane leaves and she ends up in California. Now there's a lot more to this story. There, there is a tremendous, this story has, story has so many different paths to it. But uh, yeah, this is what they did to her. All right, so. The IWW are considered a clear and present danger. Now, they were not German agents. They did not take any German gold. The, uh, in Montana, Will Campbell, who was the editor of the newspaper in Helena, was feeding the most propaganda. He was saying Germans were flying aircraft over the United States to bomb us. No. Um, they were even killing dachshunds. Did you know that? Because they were German. It was crazy. In Oklahoma, they were putting uh, bounties on heads of people. If you brought in a German person, you were paid like $5 or $10. This was crazy. Montana started all this, just so you know. They came back later. Uh, I think in the 1990s, 1980s, I'll have to look. A guy named Clem Workman, who was a professor, worked on this. And they pardoned every one of the men in Montana who were arrested under the Sedition Act. Of course, they were long dead, but they were pardoned because they realized that this was just, it was so wrong on so many levels what they did. If you were a journalist or if you were a university professor and you had written anything, you were arrested as well. I mean, they, they arrested so many people. Uh, they would grab men, they'd make them run the gauntlet, they'd castrate them. Uh, it would, this was a horrible time. So, if you look at this, this is what I was telling you earlier. I'm not going to read it to you, uh, but it is about what the Sedition Act was. And actually, this was then added to, this was like an amendment to the Espionage Act, which had passed prior to the summer of 1917. So Jane gets arrested. She heads to California because she knew California. She goes back to what she knows. And that fellow, Colonel Sellers, will not leave her alone. He wants her, he tells her, you cannot be a mother and be a member of the revolution. You can't. If you're going to be a mother, you just stay, step back. You cannot do this if you're a mother. You should never have had enough. She has two, three children now. One of them is a guy who's just very much in love with her, and she won't marry him. She, she's not going to marry again. She lived with him, but they even split. And so she, now she has three children, three small children. And she wants very much to get her charter back because she really wants to help with these domestics. And Calinel Seller says, you know, the only way you can get your goodwill back, because all the leaders were in jail now, is, uh, is start helping, starting small. You need to hand out these papers. Well, the papers were IWW papers, therefore they were sedition. The FBI or the Bureau of Investigation starts working, watching Callanelle Sellers, and because they're watching Callanelle Sellers and he's writing Jane back and forth, the dossiers, the FBI dossiers, are incredible. They're called the Old German Files. Uh, Fold 3, I don't know if any of you ever used that before if you've done any kind of research, but Fold 3 is phenomenal for any kind of military history, you know, way back when, any military history. Why is this military? Because they thought the IWW were German spies, and they call them the German Files but they weren't. Um, and so the, the, the files were just fantastic for getting information. I had all their letters back and forth because what they were doing is they would read the letters, reseal them, and send them on their way. They were opening your mail and reading it. So they find out that Jane is receiving some of the letters, therefore they start following Jane, and they're monitoring Jane. And to make a long story short, 
in December 30th, 1919. They would have done it before then, but it was Christmas, and she was American-born, and what would the public say? So they wait until after Christmas, they arrest her, and she loses every one of her children. So what happens to these players? Now, I'm not going to tell you what happened to Jane. I hope you'll buy my book or you'll do whatever, but Jane comes out real good. I'll show you here in a minute. Well, Bulkley Wells, who was having this affair with Louise Sneed Hill, uh, Louise Bulkley decides he likes this young peroxide blonde that he met at Comstock, where he was also involved on that mine, marries her. She's much younger than Louise Sneed Hill, and Louise Sneed Hill is not very happy. So he marries her. She immediately cuts off, has all of the business partners that have dealt with him, gets him cut off financially from everybody. The crash happens in 1934. He goes into the office, puts a pillow over his head, and blows his brains out. That's the wrath of a woman. Louise Sneed Hill lived in, uh, what's it called, the Brown Palace? Yeah. She ended up dying living there. She sold her big mansion. She ruled society. She ruled the Sacred 36 for years, years and years. But she ended up, I mean, she was lived up, became a well widow herself and had lots of money. Callanel Sellers ended up being arrested. He was, he was the thug. He did, he did end up being arrested. He, the photo I had of him earlier, he had these crooked fingers. He had broken all of his fingers and his hands were kind of crooked. He was the most wanted person in the United States for about a year. But he actually got out of jail and lived to be an old man. Grace Tuttle died of a drug overdose in Denver. I mean, that was bound to happen. I mean, she was not stable. And Jane, oh, Jane Street, one of her sons, David Street, became a B actor in Hollywood. He was married to some of the most, seven times, to some of the most famous actresses in Hollywood. And that's him right there. And there's Jane in the 1950s. She got chunkier. She used to, she used to tell her grandson, Oh, he, she'd have silver hair, and he, she'd be taking him for a walk, and he goes, you've got silver hair, and the next day it'd be all black. Why is your hair black today? Because I ate my vegetables. <laughs> Jane actually uh, never married again. She was very much an activist. One of the best things that ever happened was, through Ancestry, I discovered her family, and her grandson was alive in his 80s, and he had all of her letters all her documents, all of her poetry, an abundance of poetry. He had had Grace's nude photos, but he threw them away. He was in such shame seeing them. And so I actually went to Bullhead, Arizona, met him. They spread all of this out on the table. It was just phenomenal. I just donated them re recently to History Colorado so that they now have a file on her. But she ended up in a, in a studio apartment, which was actually an old office. She typed on a typewriter that had one key that didn't work, so always there'd be like a blank wherever that key was. And she wrote, and she raised her grandson. And that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> Questions? Uh, I'll be glad to answer any. Yes. Was, wasn't Molly Brown a little bit out of the mold? Oh, she let me tell you. Molly wanted to. She wanted to join. She her maids. Oh, she did. She got. She did. And they, the housewives assembly would have nothing to do with her. But Molly really kind of came a little bit later. Yeah, she came a little bit later. She wasn't part of that early bunch. <laughs> One of the women's parade. You know, they do a women's parade in Denver every year. And the women's parade uh, two years ago actually started on the site of one of these mansions where this woman was so ugly. And I thought, well, there you go. You know, she could see that. <laughs> yes? So your little, is that your maiden name? Yes, my maiden name is Little. My mother's maiden name is Little. Well, if they're Oklahoma Littles, that's where they were from. Uh, my grandma came, no, from where? Detroit. 
Detroit. Detroit. No, my family was from Illinois. They were in the Oklahoma Land Rush. My great grandpa and my uh, great great grandfather, Frank's father. Where did they come from, though, Europe? Oh, the Littles. You know, there's basic stories. Whether it was German or English, I don't know. Okay. But um, but they they were here since like I know the early 1800s. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. What happened to Big Bill? Oh, that's a good one. Big Bill Haywood died in Russia. You know what? They called him Big Bill Haywood. I have fun with this in my book. Um, and I think it's in the, it's my Frank Little book. Uh, and I'll show you both the covers of both books. I brought a handful of each if anybody's interested. But they called him Big Bill Haywood. And, of course, he got this larger-than-life myth about this big, burly miner. You know, he lost an eye in the mines. And while he was a little kid, he... he had a slingshot, he shot himself in the eye. But they didn't tell that story. And actually, he was not real big. He was about six feet tall, but they found out he was diabetic. He had all these other things wrong with him. He was not healthy at all. So he becomes, oh, he was horrible. He goes to prison because of the Sedition Act. And he could get out on bond, and it was a lot of money. And so he encourages members of the IWW to help pay his bond. This one poor woman gave her life savings to him, everything she had, and then he gets out, he takes off for Russia. And she lost her house, another woman who killed herself because she lost her home. He, he bailed on all these people who gave him money, goes to Russia, and he died of kidney disease there. And I'm sure living in Russia was not a, a, a nice place. He had a lot better here in the United States. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn also died in Russia. Now let me explain something about this. The IWWs, many of them were socialists, some of them were not. But you have to understand that what happened then about 1920, the Communist Party formed. Not all IWWs became communists. So it's a misnomer to say that they were communists. It's also a misnomer to say that they were Reds at that time because the Bolshevik Revolution had not even happened yet. But there was a, there was a group of them who became communists. And they did become an enemy. The Palmer Raids, J. Edgar Hoover gets involved. In fact, right after Jane's arrest, J. Edgar Hoover is actually part of this. And we know how that goes. And then that, you know, things kind of normalize. And then we have the Red Scare again in the 1950s. I remember that when I was a kid in the 1950s. You remember Lucy, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz and all those people that were arrested at that time. But um, there, again, that, what, that came out of Montana where they, some of these people that had been movers and shakers in the IWW became movers and shakers with the Communist Party. And a lot of them were the ones who thought, oh, we have to get to Russia. Bad, bad choice. Anything else? I have a website. I put some cards back there on the table. My website is janelittlebotkin.com. I am working on two books right now. I am writing Molly Goodnight's biography. Molly Goodnight was the wife of Charles Goodnight. She's the one who saved the Southern Bison herd. We would not have bison, American bison had it not been for her. She sent the bison up to Yellowstone. And the other one I'm writing on is on Hank Bedecker, who was a lawman in Wyoming. He was actually good friends with Butch Cassidy. Took him to prison. And then, oh, that's the interesting part about Butch Cassidy. Does he come back actually from South America or not? Well, that's what I'm into. And all of these have family and friend connections. All the books I do is because of a personal connection. As it turns out, Bedecker is my daughter-in-law who's from Du Bois, Wyoming. It's her great-great-grandfather. This is Frank Little in the IWW, The Blood, the Stain, and American uh, uh, Family. It took me 10 years to get it out. I won two Spur Awards with that. And, uh, and also the Carolyn Bancroft History Prize in Denver. And this is, the, this is the girl who dared to defy Jane Street and the Rebel Maids of Denver. And I have like five copies of each if anybody's interested. Thank you very much.